OK, great. So analysis of Boolean functions. So it's all about the Boolean function, which is a very generic sounding topic. It's like the most basic object of study in computer science. So what will this course really be about? Well, I've put up here on, on the board some highlights or topics that we're going to get to. I think we'll get to all of these. Maybe we'll miss one or two of these. And I don't know if you've heard of all of them. I'll say like two words about each one. But I, I like to put them up there to highlight the fact that we're going to be talking about topics in a lot of different areas of computer science and mathematics. So this Boolean, this humble Boolean function touches on all sorts of different interesting areas. Uh, so let me just go over these one by one. The BLR theorem that stands for Blum, who's faculty here, uh, uh, Manuel, Luby, and Rubenfeld. This is a well-known theorem from the 80s about uh, the field of, it basically started the field of property testing, which is a topic in uh, computer science devoted to uh, sublinear time algorithms and algorithms that work even though they don't even look at the entire input. So this was actually a theorem that um, is perfectly tuned for Fourier analysis of Boolean functions and we'll get to it probably at the beginning of next lecture. Arrow's theorem you might have heard of, it's, uh, it's a result in the theory of voting or social choice. Uh, Arrow won a Nobel Prize in part for proving this. And we'll prove that pretty early on too. It's also pretty cool because um, here, voting and social choice is also like a perfect model, perfectly modeled, that's a perfect framework for talking about Boolean functions. Even though you think of Boolean functions as a computer science thing or a mathematical thing, they also sort of perfectly encapsulate um, a basic model of voting. So it's interesting to interpret, it, interpret a lot of Fourier analysis from this point of view. Uh, Goldreich-Levin theorem is an important theorem from cryptography. But then it also got co-opted by people working in uh, computational learning theory. So Fourier analysis is also an excellent tool for studying uh, computational learning theory. And we'll see a little bit about the duality between cryptography and, and learning theory when we get to talk about this. Element theory, a theorem, this is uh, also important for learning theory and circuit complexity. Okay, Gaussian isoparametric inequality, this is a mathematical topic from, I don't know, you might say geometry. And uh, that might not look at all like it has anything to do with Boolean functions, especially considering Boolean functions are discrete objects and geometry and Gaussians are all about continuous space. But we'll actually see later in the course that, you know, Gaussian space is <coughs> almost like a special case of Boolean functions. And in order to understand Boolean functions completely, you have to understand Gaussian geometry first. And uh, the highest level, the reason for that is if you take a bunch of random bits, let's say 0, 1 bits, and add them up, the distribution of that as a random variable looks like a Gaussian. Okay. <coughs> Actually, that ties into this last topic that we'll get to, the central limit theorem, and additionally, invariance principles from probability theory. Um, okay, this is about constraint satisfaction problems and in approximability. This is from, I guess, algorithms, but we'll mainly focus on the computational complexity side. It's a major application area for some of the more interesting stuff in uh, Boolean functions. Um, this result is from uh, an area of math called additive combinatorics. I hope we'll get to it. Um, out of combinatorics is about studying sort of combinatorial properties of sets usually of integers and what happens if you take two sets of integers, let's say, and like form the sum set, taking all sums of one integer from one set and one from another. That also doesn't look like it has too much to do with Boolean functions, but as it turns out, um, all the questions that are typically asked in this, this field of additive combinatorics usually have the simpler model versions of the question that are easy to understand <coughs> in the context of uh, Boolean functions. And this last highlight is kind of a key player in the world of analysis of Boolean functions. This is called the KKL theorem. KKL is Kahn, Kalai, and Lineal. It's a theorem from 1988, and it's kind of like the most uh, impressive original result in the field that really showed the power and the interesting math you can use when studying uh, Boolean functions. It really took a, the study of this area to a quantum leap higher and connected it to computer science. And it has applications in several areas, um, but maybe the most interesting aspect of it is 
a powerful tool it uses to study Boolean functions called hypercontractivity. <coughs> That's a topic essentially from probability theory. And probably its most important application is in the field of random graphs. Okay, so this is like a sample of some things that we're going to talk about, and I hope to say it, I said it to hopefully convince you that we'll touch on a lot of different uh, and disparate looking areas of math and theoretical computer science. <coughs> okay, any questions so far? Uh, also, I mean, if you have some other area or topic that you related to this that you want to hear about, again, just feel free to ask about it later, post to Piazza, and maybe I'll get a chance to cover it. Okay, so this is all the exciting stuff that we're eventually going to get to. Uh, I have to apologize that lecture one will probably be the most boring lecture of all of the lectures because, I don't know, I mean, it's about Fourier analysis of Boolean functions, this course. So I have to say, like, what the Fourier expansion of a Boolean function is and give you all the most basic, you know, definitions and stuff. So <coughs> uh, hang in there, and I promise you we'll get to, like, more, somewhat more interesting stuff even by Wednesday. Okay. <coughs> so... Let's start with the, the humble subject of all of this course, the Boolean function. So here it is. F maps elements of 0, 1 to the n, usually I call those binary or Boolean strings of length n, into bits, 0 or 1. Okay, so that's an object that I guess you're probably all familiar with comes up all over the place in computer science, and that's what we'll be studying. Uh, the very first thing I want to say is it'll be payoff in this class to be like flexible about how we uh, use notation for like bits or like true or false. So, um, you know, in computer science, usually you think of uh, the two possibilities for a Boolean as false and true, and sometimes we'll use false and true. Uh, these also usually correspond to zero and one. Sometimes those are symbols, but you should also sometimes think of them as real numbers. And other times you should think of them as elements of the finite field of cardinality 2, which I'll denote like that, blackboard f sub 2. So that just means, you know, 0 plus 1 is 1, and 1 plus 1 is 0, and 0 times 1 is 0, etc. Uh, at other times, we're going to see that it can be most advantageous to represent these true and false by plus one and minus one. In fact, we're going to do this in like uh, the less obvious way, where false will be plus one and true will be minus one, which looks a little weird, uh, but it's basically because we want minus one to the power of this row to be this row. So this is going to be like the most confusing thing, perhaps for a little while, that we're most often going to think of true as minus one and false as plus one. And importantly, uh, you should really think of those as real numbers. Okay. And somehow, the fact that we're thinking of them as real numbers is what makes this analysis of Boolean functions. Okay, that all sounds a little cryptic, but, um, well, I wanted to get that out of the way from the beginning. So, most often when I say, hey, think of a Boolean function, I'm going to think f mapping minus 1, 1 to the n into minus 1, 1. And I'm going to think about this as, you know, these guys are elements of R, and these guys are elements of R too. So you can even think of this as a vector in Rn. Okay, but it's all, you know, the same object. So we're going to pass between these representations freely as well. Okay, so there it is, our best friend for the next four months. Okay, so that's, uh, I talked about Boolean and functions and analysis. Sometimes you would put the word Fourier analysis here. Uh, and so I will now explain that word. So every Boolean function has a Fourier expansion. And, you know, it's a fancy name, Fourier. Uh, but it's a really simple concept. So the Fourier expansion of a function f, okay, this just means representing the function, representation, as a polynomial, in particular a multilinear polynomial. A 
Okay. So uh, as you see in a second, it's no surprise that you can represent functions by polynomials. Uh, I'll just remind you, multilinear means that like no variable is like squared or cubed or anything. They just appear to power at most one. So let me give you an illustration of how you can represent a Boolean function by a multilinear polynomial. So I'll start with this very basic function with n equals to 2, which I'll call max sub 2. It maps a pair of bits into a bit. Okay, and it just takes the max of the two arguments. So day one, I'll literally write it all out. So 1, 1 is 1. Of 1 minus 1 is minus 1. Minus 1, 1's max is, wait, that's 1. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to catch me. If I make a mistake on the board, tell me. Uh, 1 and uh, minus 1, 1, minus 1. I should have just stopped saying words. OK. So that's it. And in computer science, you would call that the truth table of the function. You, know, you just list out all the possibilities. There are two to the end of them. And write the value of the function. OK, so that's just giving it like in like a table form. Uh, yeah, so actually, by the way, uh, if you think of our conventions for false and true, what is this function more usually called in computer science? Yeah. And, that's right, it's the and function, even though it's max. OK, so uh, how can I write this as a polynomial? Well, I'll just tell you in this case. Uh, if I think of the two input values as x1 and x2, then it's a half plus a half x1 plus a half x2 minus a half x1 x2. Uh, by the way, here's some notation that I'll use now and forever. Usually, the input to a function will be written x. So that's in minus 1, 1 to the n, and it's equal to you know, x1 through xn. OK, so um, this is indeed a multivariate polynomial. And it's multilinear, like there's no squares or cubes or anything on the x's. And it just works, right? So like if you plug in 1, 1, you get half plus a half plus a half minus a half. So that's 1. <coughs> or 1 minus 1, you get half plus a half minus a half, but well then plus a half again. So I'm not going to do the other two, but uh, it works. OK, great. So that's it. And as we'll see in a second, like this is the Fourier expansion of the max function. But it's just writing it as a polynomial. Uh, OK, let me do one more example, one of my favorite examples. Uh, this is the majority of 3 function, which maps 3 bits into a single bit. And I won't write out the 8-row truth table, but you just take the majority of the 3 bits. So for example, majority 3 of 1 minus 1 minus 1 is minus 1, because minus 1 is the more common input bit. And uh, here it is. I'll just again tell you how to write it as a polynomial. And I'll, we'll see how we got this a little later. Uh, so it's a half x1 plus a half x2 plus a half x3 minus a half x1, x2, x3. OK, and we can, let's, let's say, test it on this input. If x1, x2, x3 is this, we got a half minus a half, minus a half. This is going to be plus, so minus another half, and that gives us minus 1. OK. If you have any questions, please ask. Uh, excellent question. The question is, are there multiple expansions? As we'll see uh, soon, no. There's actually going to be a unique polynomial representation that's multilinear. But, you know, that's not a priori obvious. OK. So how do we get these? I mean, let's work on existence first before uniqueness. So I mean, how did I come up with this? Or how can you come up with it in general? Well, uh, there's a familiar method that you probably know if you have, let's say, a bunch of data points, let's say like, these are really points, you can think of them as points in Rn. Here's a little picture when n is 2. 
I mean the four points with coordinates plus or minus one look like this and max two is sort of a labeling of those four points like this one is one, this one's labeled one, this one's labeled one, this one's labeled minus one. And we really just want to get a polynomial that like, you know, interpolates this data. Yeah, you've probably seen this before, at least in the, the univariate case, you can do it with this Lagrange interpolation formula. Um, it's particularly easy in this case where you're interpolating over the points of the Boolean cube, the corners of the cube. And I'll just show you by example, and I think you'll get the, the idea. So this is how we can, this is max two, how we can get a polynomial that computes max two by sort of interpolation. So the idea is you first cook up a little polynomial that's um, one here and zero elsewhere. <coughs> and that's easy. It's one plus x1 over two times one plus x2 over two. <coughs> you see if you plug one, one into this, you get one times one, which is one. And if one of the coordinates is negative one, then you'll catch a zero somewhere, or two zeros, and it'll be zero. So let's sort of isolate this point, and so I'll multiply by the label here, which is plus one. <coughs> So now I'm sort of getting the value right at this point. So now let's get it right, let's say at this point. This is the point one comma minus one. So I'll use this little polynomial, one plus x one over two times one minus x two over two, which again is the property that on one minus one you get one times one. And on any other point, <coughs> one of these guys will be zero. Okay? So then that's great, I'll multiply this by plus one. And I can do this trick for the other point, so I'll do this one next. Times plus one. And for getting this point right, I use one minus x one over two, one minus x two over two, times the label down here, which is minus one. Okay, so this is by example, but I hope you kind of see that this will uh, compute the right values on all four points. And then you can just multiply this all out, and uh, voila, you get a half plus a half x1 plus a half x2 minus a half x1 x2. Okay, well, you need to multiply it out, but trust me. Um, okay, any questions about that? Does it make sense? So, for example, if I was going to do it for this majority of three function, I would say that majority sub three of x1, x2, x3, just trying to fit these eight labels to these eight points sitting in R3. Well, it's one plus x1 over two, one plus x2 over two, one plus x3 over two. That's going to be one just on the point one, one, one. So I'll multiply that by one, which is the correct value. Okay, and there will be seven more terms. Okay, if you heroically write that all down and expand it all out, you see there's pluses and minuses, there'll be some cancellations, and eventually you'll get this. Okay, so this, uh, I mean, it's proof by example, but you see it's a, a method for at least getting some polynomial which, you know, interpolates the function. Given any function, you can do this. And uh, let's make a couple of observations about this. <coughs> First of all, this will indeed always give you a multilinear polynomial. Can somebody say why that is? Yeah, exactly. If you just look at this, right, even when you expand this out, you never have, in each term, you never have xi more than once. So it'll be always multilinear. That's good. Another thing that uh, it's important to notice is this also works perfectly well if the function's range is r, the reals.
Okay, uh, you might think it's a little odd to look at functions from bit strings into reals. Actually, it'll be very important for us, but uh, before we say more about that, just notice that, you know, it's not important that these numbers were plus or minus one. They could have been any real numbers. I just stick them in here as the labels, and I'll get some real polynomial out, which is multilinear, and we'll compute the function on the two to the n input points. <coughs> okay, and as I said, actually, even though we ultimately care about functions that are what I call Boolean valued most of the time, the range is minus one, one, it's actually going to be important to generalize to this broader set of functions. Okay, great. So, what we've seen, proof by example, is that uh, we can get such a representation, a multilinear polynomial, for any function like this. And that's, I guess, theorem number one of analysis of Boolean functions. Every function from the Boolean cube into the reals can be represented by a multilinear polynomial. Okay, just by this interpolation pro process. And let me add it here because, you know, if this is theorem one, we may as well get the, the full theorem uh, uniquely. Okay, so this answers the earlier question. We haven't proved, and we proved this basically by construction. We haven't proved this part yet, but we will shortly. <coughs> okay. So, uh, what will that look like? We need a, I mean, it's easy when n is two or three, but we need a general notation for uh, multilinear polynomials. So what will that look like? You'll have f of x. Okay, so in a multilinear polynomial, when there are n variables, each variable is either in a term to the power of zero or one. So there are two to the s, sorry, two to the n possible monomials that look like a product of some of the xi's. <laughs> and you potentially have like a coefficient for each one. Okay, so it'll look something like this. The sum over all possible monomials indexed by subsets S of the indices one through N of some real number, a coefficient, let's say C sub S, times like the associated monomial product over I and S of Xi. Well, that's like the general form of a multilinear real polynomial. Uh, let me give a little notation here. Uh, we're going to write brackets n for this set, 1 through n. <coughs> and this uh, monomial product of xi's for i in a set s, we'll also write that as x superscript s. Sometimes. And finally, this, this expansion is perfectly fine, but it doesn't really notationally show how these coefficients depend on the function f. Okay, so it's more traditional, finally, to write, instead of cs, you'll write f hat s. Okay? That's a, just a coefficient, it's a real number. And it's called the s Fourier coefficient, or let's say the Fourier coefficient of f on S. Okay, so we can uh, use all of these notational replacements. I'll do a rude thing and just rewrite it like this. <laughs> it's not really saving a lot. Uh, sum over all subsets of 1 through n of this real number, f hat s, which is just a coefficient, times this. This is a monomial. Uh, what's the degree of that monomial, by the way? Yeah, it's the cardinality of S. Okay. And, you know, that's it. That's how you would normally write the Fourier expansion of F. 
And it's called Fourier expansion because you can derive, or you can look at it a different way through some principles of harmonic analysis on finite abelian groups. Uh, but that's too complicated. I mean, it's just writing it, the function as a polynomial. Okay, great. So all the major players are in play. Uh, as I promised, this is the most you know, boring lecture. It's just all definitions and stuff. But let's, uh, let's soldier on and talk about Fourier expansions. So uh, you may ask, why would we do this, by the way? And the reason is, you know, a Boolean function is a combinatorial object, especially if you think about it as its truth table. Maybe you think about it as uh, representing the operation of a circuit or like a, a concept class in machine learning, or maybe it's a subset of the Boolean cube or uh, a set system in extremal combinatorics. These are all represented by Boolean functions, and you often want to know combinatorial properties of them. <coughs> and it turns out that a lot of interesting combinatorial properties of Boolean functions get encoded by what these coefficients are. So if you can, you know, figure out what these coefficients are, you can often learn something interesting about the function that you couldn't learn by any other means. Okay, great. So in light of what's on the board, let me just briefly quiz you. Uh, what is the Fourier coefficient of the max2 function on the empty set? A half, yeah. What should I also mention that by convention, the product over an empty set is defined to be 1. Okay, so that's a, a freakish case, but uh, the empty set here corresponds to the constant coefficient. Okay, so that's starting with the most complicated one. So also max 2 hat on the set 1 is also a half because we're really looking right here, the coefficient on the monomial is just the product of all the guys in the singleton set 1. And um, the other ones you can see by inspection. On the set 2, it's also a half. And on the set uh, 1, 2, it's minus a half. Uh, let's say for majority of 3, I think it's also up there. Let's say, what is it on the set 1, comma 2? Zero, yep. And I don't know. You can see the other values here. So on the empty set, it's zero. And on the singleton set 1, it's a half, et cetera. OK, so it's just what is the telling you what are the coefficients in this representation. Great. <coughs> OK, so now let's take a look at this. Um, Boolean expansion again. You see each monomial here, I mean, there's two key things, the coefficient and the monomial. And there's an interesting fact about these monomials. You see, they also have the property that they're always plus or minus one valued. So in fact, each monomial, you can think of it itself as a Boolean function. Because for every input string x, it takes the value plus or minus one. Uh, so we're going to give a name to that function. So for any subset S of 1 through N, I'm going to write chi sub S for the Boolean function. So it's just equal to that monomial. So it's defined by chi S of X is the product over I in S of Xi, or in our notation, just X super S. So uh, what function, I mean, how would you name that function? What is it actually kind of computing in words? Yeah, actually, it's exactly the, it's actually exactly, yeah, the exclusive or in Boolean logic. This is the XOR. Especially if you remember, we have this notation, plus 1 is false, minus 1 is true. Uh, it's the XOR of just the bits in S. Okay. Or in other words, it's often called the parity on S. Because the output is minus 1, if and only if there's an odd number of minus 1s among the bits in S. 
See, like, you know, that's like actually the true reason why like we switched to plus or minus one notation because it has this nice property that like multiplying these guys together is like taking the parity. Um, great. So that's a Boolean function as well, which will be very important for us. And in fact, we'll sometimes even write this in like a more compact way as f equals the sum over s in 1 through n of f hat s times chi s. Okay, so this is using like the notation for an, from analysis where you can like add two functions together, and that means adding them pointwise. You can like multiply a function by a, uh, a real number, and that means multiplying its values pointwise. Um, in fact, uh, really, this is like saying every Boolean function, even mapping into the reals, is some sort of linear combination of the 2 to the n parity functions. <coughs> okay, and to make that clearer, we should um, think about things in the linear algebra perspective briefly. So, it will help if you know the most basics, very basics of linear algebra. Um, you can think of even a function as a, a real valued function as a vector, where you just take the truth table and like stack it into a vector. Okay, so you could think of the max2 function as a vector, which is a truth table. It has four entries. And, you know, this is 1, 1, 1, minus 1. Now, you have to decide on, like, an order in which to s write out the entries. So it's not very important. I don't know. I guess I'll use the order, like, 1, 1, minus 1, 1, 1, minus 1, and minus 1, minus 1. Just stack the values. Uh, and what this, for example, expansion is really saying is you can write this vector as like a linear combination. This vector is sitting in R4 of the truth table vectors for all of these parity functions. Okay, so another way to write the Fourier expansion is it's, I don't have it up anymore, but it's a half times the truth table vector for chi sub empty set. So what's the truth table vector for chi sub empty set? John Wright? That's right. It's all uh, ones because by convention, this is the empty product. This is just the constantly one function. Chi s is the constantly one function, so it has value one on all the inputs. Plus, this is chi empty set, plus a half times chi one. Okay, and this is like uh, this. No, I guess perhaps it's like this. I don't know if what my convention is for the ordering here. Uh, but this one will be like this. Minus a half times one minus one minus one one. Okay, hopefully that comes out correctly. Remember, this is the truth table of the function, chi sub 1, 2, which is the function that maps x into like x1, x2. Having written it up there, it looks a little confusing, I now see, but does it make sense? Okay, and this is like taking a real linear combination in the sense of, you know, linear algebra. Um, Okay, in fact, any function, as we, we've seen, let's say any function from minus 1, 1 to the 2 into the reals, you know, you can put any four real numbers here, that's like a function, and it'll be some linear combination of these four parity functions. Great, so that's another way of looking at the Fourier expansion. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit more linear algebra. So let me write 
v for the vector space of functions, that's short for functions, uh, f mapping n bit strings into the reals. OK, and it's a vector space because you know, if you have two functions, you can add them. That means adding their values point-wise. And you can also multiply them by a scalar. So it's a vector space over R. And I mean, it's just a fancy way of uh, looking at the usual n-dimensional space. Well, actually, two to the n-dimensional space. Right? Because if you are looking at n-bit functions, the truth tables will have height two to the n. So really, it's just isomorphic to R two to the n. OK, so in particular, it's a, it's a, what is the dimension of this vector space? This is a trivial question, hopefully. Yeah. 2 to the n, yeah. It's just the same as this vector space. OK. Um, and let's look at the existence part of this theorem, the fact that every function uh, in this vector space can be represented as a, a multilinear polynomial and therefore like a linear combination of these parity functions. That's saying that the parity functions chi s um, span this space. Okay, and the linear algebra makes sense that every guy in this space Every function is a linear combination of them. OK, but now something uh, nice happens. Um, how many parity functions are there? There's 2 to the n parity functions, one for each subset of 1 through n. And they span the space, which we already know is 2 to the n dimensional. <laughs> and so therefore, they have to be linearly independent and a basis for this space. So therefore, the chi s's functions uh, are linearly independent. <coughs> and the basis and this finally justifies the state, this part. Because well it's the most well, a very basic fact from linear algebra that in a vector space, if you have a basis, every vector has a unique representation as a linear combination of those basis vectors. Okay, you have to get slightly used to the fact that a vector here is a function, but actually this is about almost all the linear algebra we'll need for uh, the course. Um, great. Any questions? OK, so these are the, these parity functions are very special Boolean functions. We got the uniqueness. Um, great. So the next thing you often think about if you have a vector space is, uh, do I need this crazy diagram anymore? Let's hope not. Uh, inner products. Oh, I should have kept that. Sure. Uh, I think I need to push a button over here. Uh, I hope it's not like attacking like Carol and Deepak back there. Um, yeah, so there's a there's a, a inner product or a dot product that we all know and love in. Rn, it's just you, you know, multiply all the coordinates and add it up. Um, and we're essentially going to use that inner product on this vector space of functions with one like slight twist, which is that um, we're going to just divide it by a constant. We're going to normalize it in a way that makes things better. So this will be the usual inner product on V. which 
is sort of the same as r 2 to the n, except divided by, well, but times 2 to the minus n. So what I'm saying is if you're going to take the inner product of two functions or vectors in this space, do it like normal, but just divide by 2 to the n at the end. It'll have all the same properties of the inner product. It's just rescaled. So to put it more concretely, if I have two Boolean functions into the reals, their inner product is defined to be, well, 2 to the minus n, and then you just like take the dot product of the truth tables, right? So it's the sum over all x in minus 1, 1 to the n of f of x times g of x. Um, and this is like a, I mean, the reason I like to take this normalization is so that this thing becomes an average. All right, so it's the average value over all inputs of f of x times g of x. And in fact, uh, even more so than calling it an average, it's, it's nicest to call it an expectation. Okay, and so start using the language of probability, which we'll use throughout the class. Um, so in particular, I would even write it as f g's inner product is the expectation over x drawn uniformly at random from the set of possible inputs of f of x times g of x. Okay, so this notation, which we'll use forever, means x is uniformly random. Okay, so you choose it from each of the 2 to the n possibilities, and that's equivalent, and it's important to remember this view as well, of x1 through xn, the n coordinates, being independent, and you know, they're each plus or minus 1 with probability a half each. Okay. And whenever I'm like writing in tech, I also like to put all my random variables in boldface. I feel it's very helpful, but I can't really do that on the board. So you just have to um, deal with the fact, which I guess everybody's used to anyway, that they will be in plain font. I was going to make them all capitals, but like it's just too tiring to make those x's bigger. <laughs> okay. So. Okay, I guess that's natural from the perspective of linear algebra, but what does it mean for our old friend, the Boolean function? Well, in the case that we're most interested in, when these are like real Boolean functions, by which I mean Boolean valued functions that take uh, values plus or minus one, you kind of measure how similar the functions are, or like the correlation between them. So, I mean, this is like a remark. If f and g are Boolean valued, then, yeah, this is like, it's like the similarity or, or maybe correlation between these two functions. Because you see, uh, this is like the expected value if you pick a random input. And I'm also often going to get lazy and just write expected value over x. If I don't write the twiddle plus or minus 1 to the n, it's, x is always uniformly random input of, uh, well, what happens if these are plus or minus one valued? You see, if they're the same value, you get one, and if they're different values, you get minus one. So it's plus one if f of x equals g of x, and minus one if they're different. Okay, so this is also equal to the probability over x that f of x equals g of x minus the probability over x that f of x differs from g of x. Okay, so, you know, in particular, if f equals g, this is 1. <coughs> if f is like the logical negation of g, it's like the exact opposite, so f is minus g 
then this is minus 1. OK, and the closer it is to 1, the more similar they are in terms of just how often they agree. Uh, right, so in particular, this is always in the range minus 1, 1. And you could even say that I guess I wanted to write even one more inequality. If I write this as 1 minus the probability that they're different, then it's 1 minus twice the probability over x that f of x does not equal g of x. So it's sort of like 1 minus the fractional Hamming distance between the truth tables. This is fractional Hamming distance. OK. So that's why, you know, this is a nice thing to study and why 2 to the minus n is like a nice normalization. Um, it's a particularly nice normalization because we have this key fact. Uh, if f is a Boolean valued function, then the inner product of f with f is always 1. Okay, and we'll use, you know, this notation from linear algebra, I guess. This is We'll write it as the square of the 2 norm or the square of the length of f. So it says under this inner product, Boolean valued functions, the ones that we care about, are unit vectors. Okay, and that's also convenient for us. All right, let's continue this never ending parade of basic facts. I mean, I've got to give you enough to finish the homework in seven days, right? Uh, okay. And this is most important theorem number two in, in analysis of Boolean functions. We know that the set of all parity functions is a basis for this vector space V. That's how we got the uniqueness and existence of the Fourier representation. Uh, but better than that, the set of all parity functions is an orthonormal basis. Okay, that means these guys are perpendicular. Like you draw those vectors, they were out here in R to the 4 or whatever, and they literally, they're all at 90 degree angles to each other. And they're unit vectors. So, i.e., chi s chi t is 1 if s equals t and 0 if s does not equal t. OK, this is an easy statement to prove. Remember, this is the expectation. And sorry that x's kind of look like chi's. x drawn uniformly at random of chi s x, chi t x. Remember again, this is just the product of xi for i in the set S. Okay, so the proof of this is very easy. Mm, it follows from two basic facts. Fact one is that chi s of x times chi t of x is equal to chi of the symmetric difference of s and t x. That's symmetric difference, the guys that are in s but not t, or vice versa. And the proof of that is also easy. We'll just write down the definitions. This is product of i and s, x i times the product of i and t, xi. Um, so whenever you are i's in the symmetric difference, it's in one but not the other, you get one copy of xi. And whenever uh, it's in the intersection, you get two copies of xi. And I guess if it's in neither, you get nothing. But of course, xi is always plus or minus 1, so this is 1. Okay, and you're just left with this, 
which is that. Okay, that's more symbols than you really need to write for this fact, but there it is. And okay, so that means this thing inside here is really chi s symmetric difference t of x. So we need to understand its expectation. And what is that telling, asking you? It's like you look at this parity function, and um, basically you're, you know, care about the fraction of times it's plus one minus the fraction of times that it's minus one. How balanced is its truth table? And for most parity functions, it's perfectly balanced. So what I'm saying here is that the expected value of chi s of x is uh, zero. Well, if s is not the empty set, it's one if s is the empty set. Okay, if s is the empty set, this is trivial. The empty set, uh, chi sub s is just the constantly one function. So this is always one independent of x. So that's easy. Um, otherwise, well, here's one way to see it. Expected value of x, uh, this is product i and s, xi. And now we use a basic fact. If you have the expectation of the product of some stuff, and the stuff is independent, <coughs> and that's equal to the product of the expectations. It's almost a bit overkill here, but it means we can exchange the product and the expectation. Remember, for a random string, each of the bits is actually independent. And now, if you have a random bit, half the time it's plus one, half the time it's minus one, so its expectation is zero. So you get a product of zero, so it's all zero. Okay, so that ends that fact, and it also justifies this, because uh, this is the case that S symmetric difference T is not empty set. Any questions about that? Okay, great. All right, so uh, that's great. It's always pleasant when you have a basis, even more pleasant when you have an orthonormal basis. Um, because, you know, I mean, the picture now is like, in R2 to the n, you have these 2 to the n parity functions. This is some crazy drawing of them, but they're all you know, orthogonal and uh, unit vectors. Uh, and so you know, any other vector, f, you can write it as some linear combination of these guys. But in particular, it's easier now to see what the coefficients are in this linear combination. If you're writing like a vector in terms of an orthonormal basis, to get the coefficient on a basis vector, you just take the dot product. You know, it's like, it's a unit uh, vector, so you just project onto it. Um, so what I'm saying here uh, is the following, which is either a fact or a formula, depending on how you look at it. Remember, f hat s represents the coefficient on chi s or this S parity function in the Fourier expansion. And I'm just saying it's the inner product of F and chi S. It's like the length plus or minus of the projection. And I kind of explained why in linear algebra terms, but I'll also just give a proof since this is a key formula. Um, well, inner product of F and chi S. By definition, we can just write F in its Fourier expansion, so that's sum over t. I use t instead of s here. f hat t chi t chi s, inner product. And then the inner product is linear, you know, so you can take this sum and this constant out and get uh, sum over t f hat t inner product chi t chi s. Okay, and now we just saw that this thing is 1 when t equals s, and it's 0 otherwise. So everything except for f hat s drops out. Oh, 
Okay, in particular, so if you have a, a Boolean function on your hands and you have like one, let's say, Fourier coefficient that you're interested in and you want to know what, like literally what number is it, this is the formula you would use. Okay, and you can use this, um, well, it's no longer written, but the definition of the inner product. Um, okay, <coughs> we're almost to the last, well, in fact, this is the last basic theorem in Fourier analysis, and it expresses the fact that, you know, the dot product uh, is really just like you take all the, of two vectors, is you take the coefficients and you multiply them together and add them up, okay? If you ever have two vectors sitting in space, they each have an expansion in terms of the orthonormal basis, and to get the dot product or the inner product, you just multiply the coefficients pairwise and add. Um, so this observation has a name, and it's got a fancy name. It's called Plancherel's theorem in this context. It's just like the formula for dot product, so it says that if you have f and g, you can compute that also as the sum over all coefficients of f hat s times g hat s. Okay, and you can already see the emergence here, to some extent, of the theme that you can like learn something about the combinatorics of Boolean functions by studying the Fourier coefficients. We know this has like some combinatorial interpretation like how similar these functions are, and you can get it uh, if you know all the Fourier coefficients by using this formula. Okay, and I'll again prove this, although in some sense it's automatic from linear algebra. And I'll prove it in the exact same way. I'll just write this out in terms of the Fourier expansions. So this is sum over all s of f hat s chi s. In this guy I'll use again a different letter, sum over t g hat t, chi t, and then using linearity and expanding everything out, it's sum over all s and t, f hat s, g hat t, of the inner product of chi s and chi t. And again, uh, this is always zero except in the case where s equals t. So everything drops out except for the s equals t case and you get sum over s f hat s, g hat s. Okay, so this is a formula we'll be appealing to a lot. And it has a special case, a very important special case, the case when f equals g. And somehow it's also so special that it gets its own name, Parseval's theorem. I guess you'll have to learn to map these old French people's names to these basic facts, but if you take f equals g, it says that uh, the inner product of f and f, which we also sometimes wrote as the two norm squared of f, is just the sum of the squares of the Fourier coefficients. Oh, I guess Parseval and Plancherel actually prove this in the context of the usual Fourier analysis or like Fourier series of functions on the real line uh, with the coses and the sines. And there, I guess maybe because of the coses and sines, like it looks more confusing. Um, so it deserved in the 18th century the status of theorem. And then I guess this all fits into like a big broad context of harmonic analysis on abelian uh, groups. So the fancy math people like said, oh, this is also Plancherel's theorem. So Sometimes even, therefore, in this like super basic case of Boolean functions, you still call it by these names. I don't know. It's handy actually to have like a like a catchy name for this fact instead of just like otherwise you have to just like state the whole theorem whenever you want to refer to it. Uh, it actually has like a, a somewhat miraculous corollary. It, well, it's obvious, but at the same time it's neat, which is that uh, if f is like you know, the kind of function we really care about, a Boolean-valued function, 
then, well, we saw before, you know, the inner product measures the similarity of a Boolean function to itself. So this is one. Another way of seeing it, of course, is that by definition, this is expected value over x of f of x times f of x. So if f's range is plus or minus one, this whole thing is just constantly one. So what we get is that the sum of the squares of the Fourier coefficients is always one. That's a very pleasant formula. Um, it's kind of surprising. See, if you remember those two uh, examples we did right at the beginning, max 2 and majority of 3, each of them happened to have four coefficients, non-zero coefficients, each of which was plus or minus a half. Okay, so if you like square those, they all become a quarter, and then you add them up and you get one. So a miracle, it worked. But uh, that's a key fact. And it's very nice because uh, now for each Boolean function f, you get like these numbers. They're always non-negative and they add up to one. So they're really like weights. Or in fact, you can even think of them as a probability distribution because they're non-negative numbers adding up to one. Um, the probability distribution viewpoint is somewhat, oh, some people like it. I don't use it that much. Um, I like to think of them as weights, you know. Uh, the function assigns different weights to the subsets s. So I like to say that the weight of a function f on set s is just f hat s squared. So you lose a little bit of information about the coefficient by squaring it. You lose its sign, but um, it's still a very nice concept. And you can sort of, at the very high level, think of it as how important is this set of coordinates to the function f. Okay, the higher the weight, the Fourier weight that f puts on a, a set s is something to do, and we'll see this more clearly later, with the importance of those coordinates for computing the function. Okay, and in particular, uh, it says that if you have a Boolean value function, the weights always add up to one. Okay. Um, so let me wrap up with, painful though it is, since we just got through all these definitions and formulas and theorems, a few more formulas, uh, all of which are to illustrate this idea that, you know, these Fourier coefficients tell you something interesting, tell you various interesting things about Boolean functions. Um, so the very simplest example of this is the mean of a function. So we say the mean of a function f, well, it's exactly what the name implies from a probability point of view. It's the expected value of f of x when x is uniformly random. It's just the average value of the items in the truth table. And in some sense, it measures for Boolean valued functions how biased the function is towards 1 or minus 1. Okay? So in particular, we say that uh, if f's range is minus 1, 1. We say f is unbiased if uh, the expectation is 0. And again, because of our plus or minus 1 convention, that's like saying half the time it takes the value true and half the time it takes the value false. Um, okay, so uh, as it turns out, if you want to know the mean of a, a Boolean function, and you know the Fourier expansion, it's very easy. It's exactly equal to one of the Fourier coefficients. Can somebody tell me which one? Leon Kahn? That's right. Uh, it's the most basic fact. Uh, this the mean, the expectation of f of x, is equal to just one of the Fourier coefficients, the one on the empty set. Okay, and what's the proof of that? Well, uh, what is this by definition, or by the formula we have? It's the inner product of f with the parity on the empty set. And this is a constantly one function. 
So this is just expected value over x of f of x times 1. OK, so that justifies that. That's the most basic of all uh, examples of reading some information about f off the Fourier coefficients. Um, yeah, the second example of that um, is what I call the variance of f. This is exactly what it should be based on the definitions of probability. This is the expected value of f of x squared minus the expected value of f of x squared. Um, and what is this? Well, we can figure it out just by what we have on the board. This is the expected value of f of x squared. That's by parts of all equal to the sum of the squares of all the Fourier coefficients. But now we subtract this one. And this one is the empty Fourier coefficient squared. So this is just equal to the sum of the squares of all the Fourier coefficients on non-empty sets. OK, so that's a little formula that tells you what the variance is in terms of the Fourier coefficients. Now, you might say, why do I care about the variance? Well, the variance is a nice property. It sort of measures how spread out a function is, values are, or how um, how much it varies, how much it differs from being constant. Uh, in particular, it's not hard to see, and this is an exercise on your homework, that if f is Boolean valued, then the variance of f is like the prob 4 times the probability that it's 1 times the probability that it's minus 1. OK, in particular, it's 0 if f is constant, because one of these guys will be 0. And that makes sense that you have 0 variance if you're the constant function. And if you're unbiased, then that means the probability that you're 1 is equal to the probability that you're minus 1, which is a half. You get 4, a half, a half, uh, which is 1. Okay, you can also see that easily from here. If you're Boolean valued, this is always 1. So it's 1 minus your mean squared. Okay, so really the variance measures how close is f to being uh, unbiased. You know, if f you know, takes values plus or minus 1 each a lot of times, and it's, it's uh, some positive number. But if f is really close to being a constant function, then the variance is close to 0. OK, you can learn that fact by looking at the Fourier coefficients. OK, so uh, I'll end on not especially high note, just one more piece of terminology that you'll need for the homework. But as I said, you know, this is the most boring class of the semester. We're going to see some even solutions to interesting problems next time. Um, and that's just extending this definition a little bit. So one thing that we're going to see quite frequently is that a lot of these combinatorial properties that you can gain information about by studying Fourier coefficients involve exactly these things, the weights. So this is our first example. The variance is the sum of all of the weights except the empty set. Um, in particular, it's also uh, quite a good idea to stratify the Fourier coefficients in terms of their degree which, as I told you at the beginning, is also equal to the cardinality of the set. OK, so this is one more definition. For uh, an integer k between 0 and n, the weight of f at degree k is just the sum over all sets of cardinality k, or over all monomials of degree exactly k, uh, the Fourier weight. OK, and we use this notation, w superscript k of f. OK, and I'll also use this notation, w less than or equal to k of f 
for the sum over all s at most k. Okay, in particular, one thing you can see is, you know, the variance is equal to the sum of the weights at all non-zero levels. So, greater than zero of the weight at level k. And one recurring theme that we'll see throughout the course, and it's kind of interesting, is that in some sense, the one interesting or good measure of the complexity of a Boolean function in, in various ways is in terms of its weight distribution. You know, if it's a Boolean valued function, the sum of all the weights is one, where is that weight living? At what degree? And somehow the higher the degree the weight uh, is at, the more complex the Boolean function is. And a function that has most of its weight at low degrees is in many ways a lot simpler and can be, let's say, uh, learned by computational learning algorithms efficiently. Okay, so uh, that's all I'll say for today. Thanks for having the patience to sit through all these definitions. And uh, next time we'll talk about the VLR theorem and property testing.